Hello and welcome, dear fear explorers, to this, the Horror Story Corner, where today we have a story written in Japan and made up of two short but spine-tinglingly terrifying tales. The first concerning a beautiful young woman who is to be betrothed to any who can woo her. However, all who attempt must first be subjected to a macabre test. Then, our second story concerns a man in the charge of a wealthy samurai taken off to war. He promises to return and marry his beloved, but he must be careful, for sometimes promises must be kept, even beyond the grave. I hope you enjoy Lafcadio Hearns of Ghosts and Goblins. A long time ago, in the days when fox women and goblins haunted this land, there came to the capital with her parents a samurai girl, so beautiful that all men who saw her fell enamoured of her, and hundreds of young samurai desired and hoped to marry her, and made their desire known to her parents. For it has ever been the custom in Japan that marriages should be arranged by parents, but there are exceptions to all customs. And the case of this maiden was such an exception. Her parents declared that they intended to allow their daughter to choose her own husband, and that all who wished to win her would be free to woo her. Many men of high rank and of great wealth were admitted to the house as suitors, and each one courted her as best he knew how, with gifts and with fair words and with poems written in her honour, and with promises of eternal love. And to each one she spoke sweetly and hopefully, but she made strange conditions. For every suitor she obliged to bind himself by his word of honour as a samurai to submit to a test of his love for her, and never to divulge to living persons what that test might be, and to this all agreed. But even the most confident suitors suddenly ceased their importunities after having been put to the test, and all of them appeared to have been greatly terrified by something. Indeed, not a few even fled away from the city, and could not be persuaded by their friends to return. But no one ever so much as hinted why. Therefore it was whispered by those who knew nothing of the mystery that the beautiful girl must be either a fox woman or a goblin. Now, when all the wooers of high rank had abandoned their suit, there came a samurai who had no wealth but his sword. He was a good man and true, and of pleasing presence. And the girl seemed to like him, but she made him take the same pledge which the others had taken, and after he had taken it, she told him to return upon a certain evening. When that evening came, he was received at the house by none but the girl herself. With her own hands she set before him the repast of hospitality and waited upon him, after which she told him that she wished him to go out with her at a late hour. To this he consented gladly, and inquired to what place she desired to go. But she replied nothing to his question, and all at once became very silent, and strange in her manner. And after a while she retired from the apartment, leaving him alone. Only long after midnight she returned, robed all in white like a soul, and, without uttering a word, signed to him to follow her. Out of the house they hastened, while all the city slept. It was what is called an oborozuki-yo, 
a moon clouded night. Always upon such a night, tis said, do ghosts wander. She swiftly led the way, and the dogs howled as she flitted by, and she passed beyond the confines of the city, to a place of knolls shadowed by enormous trees, where an ancient cemetery was. Into it she glided, a white shadow into blackness. He followed, wondering, his hand upon his sword. Then his eyes became accustomed to the gloom, and he saw. By a new-made grave she paused and signed him to wait. The tools of the grave-maker were still lying there. Seizing one, she began to dig furiously, with strange haste and strength. At last her spade smote a coffin lid and made it boom. Another moment, and the fresh white wood of the quan was bare. She tore off the lid, revealing a corpse within, the corpse of a child, with goblin gestures she wrung an arm from the body, wrenched it in twain, and squatting down, began to devour the upper half. Then, flinging to her lover the other half, she cried to him, Eat if thou love me, this is what I eat. Not even for a single instant did he hesitate. He squatted down upon the other side of the grave, and ate the half of the arm, and said, Keko, degozari masse, mo squash so die. For that arm was made of the best quashi, a Japanese confectionery, that Saikyo could produce. Then the girl sprang to her feet with a burst of laughter, and cried, you only, of all my brave suitors, did not run away, and I wanted a husband who could not fear. I will marry you. I can love you. You are a man. O oh, Kinjuru, I said, as we took our way home, I have heard and I have read many Japanese stories of the returning of the dead. Likewise, you yourself have told me it is still believed the dead return, and why. But... According both to that which I have read and that which you have told me, the coming back of the dead is never a thing to be desired. They return because of hate, or because of envy, or because they cannot rest for sorrow. But of any who return for that which is not evil, where is it written? Surely the common history of them is like that which we have this night seen, much that is horrible and much that is wicked and nothing of that which is beautiful or true. Now this I said that I might tempt him, and he made even the answer I desired by uttering the story which is hereafter set down. Long ago, in the days of Damia, whose name has been forgotten, there lived in this old city a young man and a maid who loved each other very much. Their names are not remembered, but their story remains. From infancy they had been betrothed, and as children they played together, for their parents were neighbours, and as they grew up they became always fonder of each other. Before the youth had become a man, his parents died, but he was able to enter the service of a rich samurai, an officer of high rank, who had been a friend of his people and his protector soon took him into great favour, seeing him to be courteous, intelligent, and apt at arms. So the young man hoped to find himself shortly in a position that would make it possible for him to marry his betrothed. But war broke out in the north and east, and he was summoned suddenly to follow his master to the field. Before departing, however, he was able to see the girl, and they exchanged pledges in the presence of her parents, and he promised, should he remain alive, to return within a year from that day to marry his betrothed. After his going, much time passed without news of him, for there was no post in that time as now, 
and the girl grieved so much for thinking of the chances of war that she became all white and thin and weak. Then at last she heard of him through a messenger sent from the army to bear news to the daimyo. And once again a letter was brought to her by another messenger, and thereafter there came no word. Long is a year to one who waits, and the year passed, and he did not return. Other seasons passed, and still he did not come, and she thought him dead, and she sickened and lay down and died and was buried. Then her old parents, who had no other child, grieved unspeakably, and came to hate their home for the lonesomeness of it. After a time they resolved to sell all they had, and to set out upon a Sengaji, the great pilgrimage to the thousand temples of the Nichiren Shu, which requires many years to perform. So they sold their small house with all that it contained, excepting the ancestral tablets and the holy things which must never be sold, and the hii of their buried daughter, which were placed, according to the custom of those about to leave their native place, in the family temple. Now the family was of the Nichiren Shu, and their temple was Mayakoji. They had been gone only four days, when the young man who had been betrothed to their daughter returned to the city. He had attempted, with the permission of his master, to fulfil his promise, but the provinces upon his way were full of war, and the roads and passes were guarded by troops, and he had been long delayed by many difficulties, and when he heard of his misfortune, he sickened for grief, and many days remained without knowledge of anything like one about to die. But when he began to recover his strength, all the pain of memory came back again, and he regretted that he had not died. Then he resolved to kill himself upon the grave of his betrothed. And, as soon as he was able to go out unobserved, he took his sword and went to the cemetery where the girl was buried. It is a lonesome place, the cemetery of Mayokoji. There he found her tomb, and knelt before it, and prayed and wept, and whispered to her that which he was about to do. And suddenly he heard her voice cry to him, Anatta, and felt her hand upon his hand, and he turned and saw her kneeling beside him, smiling and beautiful, as he remembered her, only a little pale. Then his heart leaped, so that he could not speak for the wonder, and the doubt, and the joy of that moment. But she said, Do not doubt, it is really I. I am not dead. It was all a mistake. I was buried because my people thought me dead, buried too soon, and my own parents thought me dead, and went upon a pilgrimage, yet you see I am not dead, not a ghost, it is I, do not doubt it, and I have seen your heart, and that was worth all the waiting and the pain, but now let us go away at once to another city, so that people may not know this thing and trouble us. For all still believe me dead. And they went away, no one observing them. And they went even to the village of Minabu, which is in the province of Kai. For there is a famous temple of the Nichiren Shu in that place. And the girl had said, I know that in the course of their pilgrimage, my parents will surely visit Minabu, so that if we dwell there, they will find us and we shall be all again together. And when they came to Minabu, she said, Let us open a little shop. And they opened a little food shop. And on the wide way leading to the holy place, and there they sold cakes for children, and toys, and food for pilgrims. For two years they lived, and prospered, 
and there was a son born to them. Now when the child was a year and two months old, the parents of the wife came in the course of their pilgrimage to Minibu, and they stopped at the little shop to buy food, and seeing their daughter's betrothed, they cried out and wept and asked questions. Then he made them enter, and bowed down before them, and astonished them, saying, Truly, as I speak it, your daughter is not dead, and she is my wife, and we have a son. And she is even now within the father room, lying down with the child. I pray you go in at once and gladden her, for her heart longs for the moment of seeing you again. So while he busied himself in making all things ready for their comfort, they entered the inner room very softly, the mother first. They found the child asleep, but the mother they did not find. She seemed to have gone out for a little while only. Her pillow was still warm. They waited long for her. Then they began to seek her, but never was she seen again. And they understood only when they found beneath the coverings which had covered the mother and child something which they remembered having left years before in the temple of Mayakoji, a little mortuary tablet, the ei of their buried daughter. I suppose I must have looked thoughtful after this tale, for the old man said, perhaps the master honourably thinks concerning the story that it is foolish. Nay, Kinjura, the story is in my heart. Well, it seems that the young woman in our first story found her true love. After all, it isn't many who would go for such a macabre feast. Luckily, it was all just an elaborate test. Otherwise, the samurai may have found himself a ghoulish, permanent member of the horror story corner. Unlike the poor soul in our second story, whose love went beyond the grave, but wasn't quite enough to anchor down his lover's spirit for the rest of his days. Still, at least he was able to spend some time with his beloved, here, within the horror story corner. Good night, dear friends, and as ever, sleep well. <laughs>